Hello, everyone. Welcome to the July webinar for the Water Ambassador Program. The Water Ambassador Program is a partnership program between Martin County and the University of Florida IFAS Extension's Florida Sea Grant Program. Um, we are have sort of nearing the end of the Water Ambassador Program for 2022. We have a few more presentations coming for you in August and September, and we'll be putting the presentation registration links in the chat for you um, once we're done with the introduction. Uh, we will also be putting the webinar recording links in the chat for you so that you can see all of our previous webinars from this series. So just as a reminder for all of you, we do ask that you keep yourselves muted and um, that you keep your video off um, for uh, to optimize the bandwidth. If you're having troubles hearing us, just click that up arrow and you can mess around with the audio settings. Um, if you need to leave us at any time, just click the leave button at the right. And we suggest for um, using the side-by-side -side mode so that you have the best control. Again, we will be recording these with this crazy long wonky link, and which we'll be putting in the chat for you um, to have better access. And we'll be holding all of our questions until the end. So please put the your questions in the chat box um, so that we can refer to them as um, they come in in order and then once we're done with the presentations, we'll answer all of the questions. And we are so pleased um, to have Dr. Nazrin Alamdari uh, join us today for the July webinar. Dr. Alamdari is currently an assistant professor at the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at FAMU FSU College of Engineering. She received her PhD in Biological Systems Engineering from Virginia Tech. She has an MS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Sharif University of Technology and a BS in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Tabriz University. Nasser is a postdoc um, at the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department in Colorado School of Mines for two years. I didn't even know that was a thing, but it sounds super awesome. <laughs> Nasser focuses primarily on the areas of urban hydrology, green infrastructure, stormwater management, sustainable and resilient urban water systems, natural and nature-based solutions, um, and then the impact of stressors such as climate and sea level rise on hydrology and water quality. The principal goal of Nazrin's research is to develop novel tools and frameworks to advance the understanding of ecosystems shaped by human decisions um, and our consequences and identifying new opportunities to improve water quality and reduce the risk of hydrologic extremes such as floods and droughts. And so the presentation today is gonna be on developing a statewide tool to control nutrients in urban communities using urban stormwater best management practices. So Nazrin, thank you again for um, joining us for the Water Ambassador Program, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thanks everyone for um, for joining. Um, yeah, I uh, today I would like to talk about this statewide tool to control um, nutrient in urban communities. So I would like to share my screen. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see the screen? In presentation yes, we mode? can. And it's in presentation mode. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Um, so as uh, Lisa mentioned, I started about two years ago here at Florida State University. And um, I actually, um, after two months of joining, I um, talked to Florida Department of Environmental Protection and I got funding to develop a statewide tool um, to control nutrients in urban communities using stormwater based management practice. So it's going to be a tool that can be applied anywhere in the state and um, people will know um, like uh, where they can implement stormwater based management practices, uh, what type of based management practices, what size, what number, what would be the most cost effective strategy. So I'm going to talk about this tool and I'm going to give a little bit about background about stormwater management, stormwater issues. Uh, so just give me a second. I have uh, so many stuff here I need to. Okay. 
All right. Um, so as you know, stormwater is runoff caused by um, rainfall events, snow ice melt, and also stormwater is runoff from outdoor water use, such as uh, washing the cars or water in the garden. And um, stormwater runoff um, is always uh, flowing off from impervious surfaces, such as parking lots, sidewalks, um, and also roofs, um, some, some hard surfaces. And um, then when you have this runoff, uh, they can tr transport pollutants, debris, trashes, um, and then um, they, they, these pollutants can go to downstream water bodies, such as rivers, streams, lakes, and even stories. Um, the question is, uh, why is stormwater runoff increasing? Um, so to start with that, that um, the world urban population is growing. So based on the projection of population, you can see that urban population is increasing, rural population is decreasing. And since we have population growth, we are going to have, we're going to need more um, houses, more buildings, more roads, um, more sidewalks, and it will add impervious surfaces. And then it, it would um, worsen the, runoff and flooding conditions and transport of pollutants. This is something that maybe you have seen um, um, in like uh, different presentations, like if you have natural ground cover, like trees and vegetations, and if we change it to like one building, two buildings, or a couple of buildings, then um, the runoff and the chance of flooding will increase. Uh, but, and also we're gonna have less infiltration, less evapotranspiration, but when we have natural ground cover, it means that less runoff, more evapotranspiration, more infiltration. Uh, so we have less flooding issues. And less runoff means that less transport of, uh, of pollutants into downstream water bodies. Um, so there is a question here that how we can control these stormwater issues, um, how we can reduce runoff, how we can reduce nutrient loading into downstream water bodies. Is there any way to do that? Um, there are some management strategies. Uh, we call them stormwater control measures or People call them differently, uh, like best management practices or stormwater control measures or low impact development or green infrastructure uh, or GI. Um, so they are pretty much the same. So I'm using stormwater control measures, but you know, I might use green infrastructure. I might use best management practices. They are all kind of the same uh, practices and I would define them. Uh, these are practices that are designed to, um, you know, they, they, they can mimic the natural ground, the natural hydrology, and it can improve water quality, they can reduce flooding, they can protect wetlands and aquatic ecosystems, um, they can conserve water resources, and also they can protect public health, um, they have air quality improvement. Um, maybe you have heard some of those, or maybe you have walked by or or maybe drove by some of these um, practices like wet ponds, wetlands, uh, bioretention systems, porous pavements, green roofs. Um, so each of these um, stormwater control measures has its own capability in runoff reduction, in nutrient removal. One practice may remove pollutants by 30%, 40%, another one, may um, remove, uh, it's really good in re removing nutrients or heavy metals, but it's not good in uh, reducing peak flow. So each of these practices has its own capability and has its own strengths and weaknesses, um, but um, it depends on the goal and it depends on the type of the practice, the size of the practice, how much money you would spend for implementing and operation and maintenance of that practice. Um, it depends on so many things. And then when you design that, then um, that practice can remove pollutants or can reduce runoff by some, some percentage. Another thing that, um, there, there, there is an issue related to climate change. Um, so we have this urbanization and population growth. 
And climate change are increasing precipitation and temperature um, may aggravate the negative effects of urbanization. So we have, um, so recently we've got a lot of hurricanes. So extreme events have been increasing. And then we have sea level rise issues. Um, uh, for example, in Miami-Dade County, where it's close to Biscayne Bay, um, you know, there are, there are some, some sea level rise issues, groundwater table is very high. Um, and these sea level rise will affect the groundwater table. And sometimes in those situations, um, we have when we have urbanization and population growth, climate change may worsen um, those effects of negative effects of urbanization. So uh, one of the things that is a question, and we had lots of problems in our county as well, because um, I am part of science advisory committee in Lone County. In some, uh, at some point, I've heard that um, they designed a pond, and then um, like the pond is not like it's not the it's not been a long time that they had a pond, but they had overflow of the pond um, due to um, the extreme event. Uh, so the reason for that is these urban stormwater control measures um, are designed based on the historical precipitation. Um, and then they did not consider the future. We need to consider if you want to design a pond, we need to consider what happens to rainfall duration, frequency, distribution. So those are also important. And we need to consider climate change impacts as well when we design a pond. Still, we need to also look at the cost because the cost is also important when we need additional storage. It means that we need additional cost. But um, in a couple of slides, I will show you my tool that how it can help us to come up with the best strategy in terms of benefits and costs in, in, in the face of climate change. And how climate change may affect the, these practices. Um, so for example, we have a wet pond and the pond collects the stone water. This is how a pond works. Um, and then sediments and pollutants settle down and then plants and soil break down pollutants and then water leaves throughout floor or soaks into the ground. And then we are gonna have cleaner water in terms creeks and streams. So this is how a pond works. But when we have this climate change, it will disrupt everything because a settling velocity and hydraulic retention time, residence time is very important in removing pollutants in the pond. And when we have more flow coming into the pond, this hydro retention time or residence time will be shorter, then it cannot remove all the pollutants in that short period of time. So that's why the pond will be affected um, by uh, like higher level of precipitation or extreme events. These are just some of the examples that like um, there, there's, there were some pond failures across the US, um, like Scambia County stormwater pond fails um, due to flooding. And also I've already Massachusetts, there, there was another, another pond uh, which um, like they had a lot of fish kills uh, because the pond was failed and could not remove pollutants as it was supposed to. That's why uh, there, there were a lot of uh, fish kills. And there are um, there's a lot of stormwater situations, Florida. Since we have this climate change issues and extreme events and hurricanes, um, we have experienced a lot of flooding issues, and it would it would continue increasing. And also, it's not just that because when we have flooding issues, then these flooding and runoff will transport pollutants like nutrients into downstream water bodies, and then we are getting um, algae blooms and harmful algae blooms. Uh, they are due to high level of nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen, mostly phosphorus. Uh, so these climate change will affect everything. Um, so one thing that's really important for us is, um, okay, so we are saying that climate change may aggravate everything, may affect the functionality of these stormwater-based management practices, what we can do, how we can plan for the future. 
As you may know, implementing this green infrastructure or stormwater control measures can have large upfront and recurring costs, and sometimes funding for water quality programs is limited. And um, we need to have kind of decision support tools to plan for GI if, if you want to decide for the future, we definitely need, need um, to have a planning tool to find out what we can do in the future, because we cannot wait until that time and say, hey, let's do that at that time. Let's let's plan it uh, from now and see that um, what are the scenarios that may happen in the future? What are the precipitation scenarios? Uh, what would be, so based on that precipitation, what would be the peak flow? And then based on that, we can design or we can come up with the most cost-effective strategies. So we would like to answer some of the key questions. Um, how effective are Green infrastructure or low impact development or, or BMPs and reducing runoff and pollutant loadings. What are the most cost effective solutions for meeting water quality and quantity objectives? And where, what type and how extensive should the GIs be? There are so many tools available, um, like by EPA or there are some agencies developed um, different tools uh, for um like different scales like site to watershed scales to county scales to city scale uh like epa national stormwater calculator um north carolina State university rainwater harvesting model um there are, there are other tools like epa's green long-term control so i listed them all here but um most of them they can estimate the cost um some of them they can estimate the cost but they can they don't have the capability of the siting those stormwater control measures like where where they can be implemented what would be the most the best locations to implement them because if you cannot implement these stormwater based management practices everywhere. Um, we need to look at the land use, land cover. You need to look at the soil. There are some specific soils. There are some specific groundwater table that we need to consider um, the, the distance from the roads, distance from the buildings. So there are, there are many things that we need to consider when we are developing a siting tool. Uh, so these tools, um, sometimes they have siting um siting capability but they cannot do come up with the most cost effective strategies based on the optimization um some of them are due cost estimation but it's just estimation of the cost um it wouldn't give you the best and most cost effective strategy when i'm saying the most cost effective strategy or the optimal strategy it means that we can get the most benefit of that practice with the minimum cost so we are getting different different results and then based on the results that we can get um, after running our tool then um, then everyone has this capability to select based on the nutrient reduction that they want like if you want to get 50 percent reduction of nutrients then it would it would may give you 200 different solutions and then you can come up with the best solution like what is the minimum cost what is the maximum benefits this is what you can get based on the tool that we are developing um i started developing our swim cost so um during my graduate study but that tool was very specific to state of virginia i mean specific to a watershed in virginia actually but then when i came here i wanted to expand and build on that tool to be a tool that would be applicable in everywhere it's very easy to use and as you know um there is a bmp train tool um uh, that can do cost estimation and it can assess the best management practices but it wouldn't give you the most cost optimized strategies the most cost effective strategies. so our tool is going to be something like some planning tools that you can plan what would be the most cost-effective strategies in the future. So you can you can plan for those strategies. Um, so our tool uh, is integrated, this scalable decision support tool for gain infrastructure planning. Um, it's planning level tool suitable for project prioritization. 
And the components are BMP siting, it can model hydrology and water quality, it can do BMP cost optimization. And then by cost optimization, it means that we can identify and set up the most cost-effective green infrastructure. And then we are using uh, optimization algorithms, which minimize the cost, maximize reduction of runoff volume, sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So these are just optimization algorithms. I, I don't want to get into depths of these algorithms, but we are going to use um, two, three different optimization algorithms because they are they they are different. And you know, we would like to see that what kind of practices uh, we get which with which um, different algorithms so the user has um, the like option to select the optimization algorithm. So the tool um, can be used at site scale or at the watershed level. Um, it has BMP selection module. Um, it would include life cycle cost assessment, which is really important. My last version of tool that I developed during my graduate study, it, it was just based on the capital cost of the stormwater management practices. But uh, one of the things that's, um, that I found was um, sometimes the cost of operation and maintenance of those stormwater management practices, some of them operation and maintenance is much more expensive than the capital cost. So you need to look at the life cycle cost assessment, the capital cost, operation and maintenance cost, end of life. And we are going to include that in our tool. We are going to look at multiple range of stormwater waste management practices. Right now, we are looking at 11 different um, BMPs. And then uh, user can select low impact development parameters or BMP parameters, and it's going to be an interactive map. Um, so there are, there are a couple of these um, BMPs that we included in our tool, porous pavement, constructed wetland, infiltration basin, bioretention, rain barrel system, wet pond, dry pond, infiltration trench. Uh, we included everything there. And um, again, the user can define those stormwater control measure parameters, which area soil thickness will be optimized. So these are all the parameters that the user can enter for, uh, for, for all the best management practices. And this is how um, the map will look like. So I'm going to show you um, at the end that how the tool works. We are on the first phase of the project. So the, the project has two different phases. One phase is um, BMP siting module. And the second one is going to be BMP cost optimization module. Uh, so we just finished the BMP siting module, and if you have an interactive map, you can select a specific county, and then you can select specific BMP, and you can see that where those BMPs can be implemented. But before showing that, I would like to show you that uh, what are the objectives of this research, why we developed, we decided to develop this tool. As I mentioned, I talked about climate change, I talked about this tool and how green infrastructure can be costly and expensive. Um, so what we decided to do is um, we decided to develop this BMP siting module first and then look at different climate change scenarios because we have different climate models in greenhouse emission scenarios, we have worst case greenhouse, I mean, emission scenarios, we have medium, we have low, but we don't know which one would happen. So um, we are getting those climate models, getting those scenarios, uh, looking at the range of changes in precipitation and temperature, and then we will include those in our tool. So for the first part, as I said, this is the BMP siting module. We got data collection, data processing, identifying the BMP locations, building the BMP data set, and transferring the data in the web-based platform. So what we did was uh, we got the data for the state, like ground elevation, land use, imperviousness, soil layer, groundwater elevation, drainage network, and road network. And these are the criteria for BMP locations. So um, you see that all of those BMPs, um, they have some criteria like 
uh, what is going to be the drainage slope for, for implementing bioretention? What is going to be the impervious? What is going to be hydrologic soil group that bioretention can be implemented? What would be the distance of the bottom of that BMP to groundwater table? So these are the criteria that we found based on the, the EPA um, document. And then uh, we included them in development of the tool, like what is going to be the building buffer, stream buffer, road buffer. So these are really important for each practice. We did data processing. Um, so based on the ground elevation, we got slope. Based on the land use, uh, we um, we also divided that to private ownership, public ownership, uh, because it's really important. Um, some some uh, some of these. Uh, lands are public lands, some of them are private lands. So we have these options. So the user has options to uh, say, if it's a public land, um, then what are the best um, locations to implement? If this is private, if we wanna add the private as well, like what are the options for implementing those BMPs? And then uh, for finding the BMP locations, uh, we uh, so we had the land use, ground elevations, and then we got these road, water bodies, land suitability, impervious soils, groundwater, based on all the criteria we uh, we found the BMP locations, and then we transferred everything to um, to the web based tool. So these are just the BMP locations in Miami-Dade County. Again, I'm going to show you um, exactly how the tool looks like, but these are uh, like, so that in the like green roof, porous pavement, wet pond, grass soil, you can see all the figures here. Like you can see that in the Miami-Dade County, where the green roofs can be implemented, where the porous pavement can be implemented, fire retention, grass soil, wet pond. Um, and again, these are based on all the parameters that I mentioned, like land use, soil, um, ground elevation, slope, roads, and all the data that we have. This is how the base tool looks like. Um, and then I would like to show, like the, the, just to do the demonstration of web-based tool before I continue work, talking about climate change, I would like to show the web-based tool, but I would like to make sure that you are seeing everything. Um, so let me just open the tool, but I'm not sure, can you see? We are still seeing your presentation. Okay, just give me a second, then I stop share and again share the screen. Okay, uh, how about now? Can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, this is our tool. Um, and then uh, we, we haven't decided about tool, but it, right now it's BNP scope, but we are going to change it for sure. Uh, these are all the counties across Florida. And then uh, we have all the legends that you can see that we have all the county boundaries. Um, and then we can uh, here, you can find the BNP solutions. You can see that BNP solutions, we have green roof, cistern, rain barrel. I assume that you're seeing everything, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Constructed that line. So um, we um, decided to have one specific picture for each one, like green roof, system, rain barrel, constructed wet line. So in the left-hand side, you can see that how they would look like. And then uh, what you can do is, so this is the layer list and um, just I uh, turned on the BMP solutions and then uh, you know, so you can select your, for example, bioretention and apply, and then it will tell you. So this is this is hard to see, right? Uh, because these are for all the counties. You can see that uh, where they are. So if you zoom in, you can see that um, in each county where they are located. But also uh, there, are, there is a filter option that you can select the name of the county, uh, for example, Broward County. And then land ownership, as I mentioned, it's that public or private. And then once you select that, you can see that in Broward County where the bioretentions can be implemented. Nazrin, would you show us Martin County since this is the- Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Martin County. Just give me a second. I go to Martin County and let's say it's public. Just give me a second. 
okay, this is the market counting, and this is just the bioretention where they can be implemented. There are not so many locations for bioretention, but you have the option of like selecting other BMPs if you want to have like uh, grass swell. Um, and then you apply, you will find out where the grass swells can be implemented. Or um, like if you want to have infiltration trench, um, just one location. And then if you want to have green roof, um, there's, I'm sure that there are mostly some locations that like some buildings that you can implement green roof. Um, or maybe you can select um, some others like the rain barrels um, or wet pond again the same so you can see that where the wet ponds can be located again you can zoom in and see that where it's exactly located and you can also um, click on that so bmp type the county is this and what is the land type so you can see everything here and uh, for that county a specific county also you can see what is the population um, in 2000 2010 um, and also you can see some of the socioeconomic uh, data as well um, this is how the, it, the tool works. And also another thing that you can do with the tool is there is an option of find address or place. So instead of selecting the county, you can type your address and then, um, or maybe you can say um, like near me, uh, you can select that. Uh, like, so this option of near me. And then once you like say five miles or 10 miles, it, it would give you the option for the, uh, BMPs as well, like where those um, BMPs are located uh, between five miles or 10 miles or 15 miles of where you're living. Uh, but again, it depends on if it's a public land, it's a private land. So you will select those and then because some of them are residential. Um, so you may not have a permission to put, but if you have, then we have this public and private land that you can select and where, where those BMPs can be located. But again, this is the first phase of the project, which we, it's just BMP siting. So we just looked at land use, soil, slope, elevation, those kind of things to come up with the locations. But the next phase, we will come up with uh, like what would be the most cost-effective strategy? So um, we may have like in each county, like Martin County, we may have uh, like five different VMPs, like uh, maybe two wet ponds, one purse payment and two by retentions are the most cost-effective strategy in that county. And it would give you the cost, it would give you the benefit, like the user probably would select how much reduction they would get uh, for the nutrients, for example, they would select 40%. And then um, the tool would give you what would be the most cost-effective strategy, or they can give you set up the most cost-effective strategies. Then you have the option to select one of those based on the feasibility of um, those BMPs and locations. This is I wanted to share, uh, but then I want to go back to the screen of the, I mean, the presentation again. Uh, okay. Um, then, um, as I mentioned, uh, so then I, I talked about the next step, and this is how it would look like. Um, this is the animation that I made that how um, you can see all the results and solutions after we developed the, the second phase. You can see that, uh, like, um, that this animation shows you that uh, where, where those BMPs can be located and also it would give you the number of those BMPs and type of those BMPs and then every time uh, you would see what would be the cost and what would be the reduction. These are just some of the examples based on my previous work um, that, that I told you that I built on my tool, my, my recent tool based on that, um, that like um, how, uh, how, how I developed my cost optimization tool. And you see that like there are some parking lots, there are some rooster, and then based on the required load reduction, it was for Chesapeake Bay uh, TMDL, it was based on Chesapeake Bay TMDL, and then um, you wanted to get some load reductions, and then you wanted to find what would be the most cost-effective strategies, uh, what would be the number of those BMPs and type and size of those BMPs. This is another work that I did uh, for the TSS load reduction, and then 
uh, again, this, this cost effectiveness curve is really important because you can see um, that what is the cost and what is the percentage reduction. This is another strategy that I used when I was in Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I updated my tool to uh, come up with the best strategies for annual infiltration increase because I was working on the California watersheds and in California groundwater was really important and they wanted to see what are the effects of stormwater control measures in groundwater recharge um, and how we can use the groundwater. So that in that particular goal, we wanted to see how much we can increase infiltration and what would be the most cost effective strategies. Um, and as I mentioned, I talked about climate change. Um, so we want to use the tool at the end um, to see that what would be the most cost effective strategies in the face of climate change. When you have um, historical precipitation, you may get um, some of the cost effective strategies, but when we have climate change, also we would like to see that based on different range of scenarios, what would be your most cost effective strategy? Um, so uh, this is part of, so this project is part of Everglades Foundation uh, money that we got um, for projecting climate variables using the recent socioeconomic pathway, CMIP6 data. These are the most recent climate change data. And also we have different greenhouse emission scenarios, but we developed a workflow um, to, to get those climate data, to get all those scenarios. And once we develop the workflow, it can be applied anywhere. So um, we, we started with um, like 20 stations within the Everglades. And then we got all the climate models and scenario because we have a lot of these climate models. We have about 32 or more than that. Um, and each climate model has its own scenarios. We have a uh, lower emission scenario. We have medium emission scenario. We have high extreme emission scenario. We've worked on the medium and extreme um, greenhouse emission scenario for um, 27 stations across Everglades. But since we developed our workflow and algorithm, so it can be applied anywhere. So we acquired the data and processed precipitation, temperature, daily precipitation, daily minimum, average, maximum temperature. We started with five different global climate models because some of so these models are global climate models. Um, so if you want to see how these work in the local scale, you need to uh, refine those data. You need to downscale those data to the local station. So there are so many methods that are designed to downscale and refine those data refine those global climate models to local stations. And we did that for these 27 stations across the Everglades. Um, and then um, uh, we uh, did some downscaling um, to just, um, as I mentioned, we need to downscale because these are global climate models. And if you want to get the local stations, to see what happens in local, we need to down a scale and also bias correct. Bias correction means that, um, you know, it's like validation. Um, you have the observed historical climate data and then you have this modeled uh, climate data. And then you down a scale those historical model data and then compare with the observed, see that how these models work and then do some bias correction. Um, so you will correct some of these errors that we may have. And then you can apply it for the future and see that how climate will change in the future. This is how we are working with the climate data because most of these climate data are global or regional, but they are not local. This is something that all the time we have problem with that. And there are so many uncertainty around that, but we are reducing uncertainty and errors by using downscaling and applying some of the methods to bias correct the data. So as I mentioned, this is downscaling. So it means that we, um, get the data from the global climate models and then refine the data to local stations. And then uh, we wanted to check the accuracy of the data. Um, and we found that we could reduce the errors and um, significantly. And uh, this is the precipitation data. And also we did that for air temperature as well, uh, before and after downscaling. 
So what is the next step for this project is, um, so as I mentioned, we have mixture of this. So, um, so the next step is uh, we have these climate models, um, as I mentioned, right now we just did five and we have started doing five more based on these 10 different climate models and different greenhouse emission scenarios, we are getting the, you know, um, so we, we may, you may get, um, like 20% increase in precipitation with one model, you may get 10% precipitation increase in another model. Another model may give you 5% increase in precipitation. So different models behave differently because they have different algorithms, different configurations and assumptions. But what we need to do is uh, we get, um, there is a term, uh, we, we say ensemble approach. It means that, uh, so you're not trusting to one model. We are doing these for 10, 15 climate models, and then we get the median change or something like that, or some advanced approaches but if I, if I just want to make it simpler it's just like you get the mean change or average change based on these 10 climate models you're not going to just trust in one we are having the results of 10 and get the average change based on these climate models and then uh, once we get those climate um, the climate models we're going to add that to our interactive tool that i showed you and after we develop the second phase of the project the most cost effective strategies without climate change and then we will add climate scenarios, see that what would be the most cost-effective strategies uh, when we add different climate change scenarios. Um, so these are the next step of my research, and I'm sure that by next year, um, we are gonna have an update on the cost uh, optimization tools. So these in everything will be built on these interactive tools. Right now it's just citing, but next year um, our plan is to add the cost optimization and uh, selecting the most cost effective strategies. And then adding climate change is not that hard because right now we have some results of climate change. And then you're going to add those climate scenarios right after that. So by next year, we're going to have a pretty good uh, thing um, for, for the tool. Another thing that I just wanted to mention um, uh, that we're going to add to our tool at some point is um, we are also looking for adding some um like right now it's just water quality like nutrient reduction but um after we do cost optimization for water quality it's it's something um which is not the fdp project but it's something that another student of mine is going to work on that uh, to provide a quick screening assessment of potential costs and benefits of different new infrastructure investment options because um Many people may think that it just have water quality improvement, but it has a lot of um, a lot of benefits. It can uh, reduce its water treatment needs, uh, can improve water quality, reduce um, green infrastructure needs, reduce flooding, increases available water supply, air quality, reduce energy use. But if people know what would be the cost of them, like how much, how much save we save the money then it would help them to understand the benefits better so we are gonna add something like this to our tool to not just looking at water quality and quantity but also looking at other benefits and how how much money we can save for each benefit that green infrastructure would provide and this is going to be added to our um tool so um the the good thing is fdp yesterday just sent us an email of that we are gonna give money to you to add this thing also to your tool um in the next three four years so we are gonna definitely add something like this to our tool to have something more comprehensive and holistic um, and uh, understand better uh, like the benefits of different green infrastructure investment options. Um, but other than that, um, I think if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Nazreen. I am, um, we do have a couple of comments and questions in the chat. And while we go through those, I'm going to pull up the poll for our participants. Um, you should be used to this by now. <laughs> Quick four questions shouldn't take you more than a minute to complete. 
Um, so William Klein has, I think it's more of a comment than a question, but perhaps you can um, provide additional comment based on it. it. says, there's a great difference in retention pond design and their effectiveness. Most ponds fail their design criteria. Many are surrounded by turf grass and use herbicides to kill plant growth. They are filled to their overflow level and they drain immediately during rains and there's no nutrient absorption. These ponds are useless and may cause more pollution than the input runoff. Biodetention ponds with trees and littoral plantings are far superior to the normally wet retention ponds that are usually filled up. So I don't know if you want to maybe address that or speak yeah, to I've, comment yeah, at all. I've heard, yes, I've heard something like that as well. But again, um, it, I think it's not it's not correct for every pond, uh, but that's 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 totally true that um, if we have these ponds that you mentioned, biodetrition ponds with trees and literal planting, yes, they are far superior. Um, right now, we just we just have these bed ponds in our tool, but I'm sure that um, in the future, since it's really hard to, like, if you want to include new, new best management practices, we need to come up with... Uh, like a lot of things, because as I mentioned, we are also evaluating life cycle cost assessment. Right now, we know everything about bed pond, but if we are going to add a new BMP, it takes time to learn all the things about life cycle and the, the, the operation and maintenance, those kind of things we need to have an estimation for sure. But that's a really good suggestion. Maybe at some point, we need to add something like that in our tool as well. But yes, that's that's really true comments. Thank you. Thanks. And the next comment um, is very interesting work indeed. Thank you. How have you determined cost effective? Um, Lucy missed the beginning of the presentation. Um, but she wants to know who this tool is designed for. Is it for private developers or government entities? And does it include what individual citizens can do? Yeah, so uh, is the, this is for government entities. Um, so decision makers, urban planners, they can use it. Um, so right now it's designed for them that they have like some basic knowledge of um, like green infrastructure, then they can play with that. But for the cost effectiveness, um, so this is the term that we are using. So I showed you a curve that um, it has the benefit in Y axis and the cost in X axis. And then the cost effective, I mean, um, the optimal solution, the best solution that you can get, like based on the benefit, like let's say you want to get 40% reduction in nutrients and you may get um, different set of solutions that they may have different costs. Uh, for example, you're running your tool and then you may get one green roof, two ponds and bond bio retention, which would be the cost of like 400K with the same reduction. And you may have another solution, which is two buyer retention, three ports payment at lower cost with the same, again, with the same nutrient reduction. Then what are you gonna select is, so you're gonna get a lot of these set of solutions that they have the same reduction, same different practices. You're gonna select the most cost effective based on that. Like nutrient reductions are the same. You're gonna select the optimal solution based on the cost. Which one would be the, how would you would have the minimum cost? This is what I meant by cost effective solutions. I mean, cost beneficial, I would say, like they have the benefits, maximum benefits of nutrient reduction, minimum cost. Great, thank you. And Joshua Mills adds another comment, says um, innovative technologies for total phosphorus removal and fertilizer ordinances help to abate the excess nutrients. Uh, so are you talking about innovative technology? So I have the same comment as these biodetrition ponds. Uh, it's, so at this stage, we are looking for uh, like because we have a lot of data and information about uh, the the like especially for the life cycle cost assessment for the the BMPs that we currently have. So innovative technology, maybe we're gonna add those later when we have more information about those because it's really hard to find what is the operation and maintenance cost for different parts of and materials of the those innovative technologies. But that's absolutely a correct comment. A true comment, yeah. And we have um, a participant who is in the process of implementing a splash pad in the local public park. 
and they ask if there is a tool for splash pads. Mm, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard anything about that, uh, but uh, no, that's that's really nice. I, I will write it somewhere, but I haven't heard anything about that. Um, again, this tool is just uh, based on the current BMPs that we have. So I have a question um, while we wait for um, more to populate in the chat box. Um, once this tool is complete, how can um, people find it? Where will they be able to access oh, it? Oh, it's going to be publicly <laughs> available. Uh, so it's the FDP would have the tool. So like BMP Train, BMP Train is free to use open source. So it's going to be like BMP Train. Everyone can use that. So it's uh, it's so FDP is own, would own that. So and also it's going to be available. We are going to have a website as well. I, I forgot to mention that we're going to have a website which has all the manuals and everything about the tool. Um, so we are building that as well. So how to use that and what are those BMPs, specifically each BMP, um, you can have, you can get a better understanding of each BMP and then you can, you can select those BMPs. But yeah, absolutely working on that as well. But yeah, you know, it's, it's the, the only, the, the, the thing that I love um, is um, this is my strategy all the time. Um, I'm saying I'm in academia and working on research, but I would love to develop innovative technologies, tools um, that everyone can use that. It shouldn't go to the shelf, but everyone should use to that. So this is how it works. And I, I don't like to just publish something and get something out of it without using that. So these tools are very helpful. That's why I'm looking for something like that. Thank you. And you know, that's all a C grant application of science based. Yeah, tools. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, Aurora asks, um, how can we find out when the tool goes live or do you oh, have yeah, an that, estimated that's a, date? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I haven't said that about that, but probably uh, we need to talk with the, I need to talk with FDEP about that. Uh, but I'm sure that they, um, by, at, by that time, this, this is a three-year project. So um, our deadline is December, 2024, I think so. Yes, um, yes, the start 2021. So in two years, we need to finish everything. So by that time, you would hear something by FDP, and I'm I'm sure that I would also, um, you know, advertise this tool, announce that tool everywhere. So I'm sure that um, Lisa and everyone here, UFIFAS, also would help me to advertise everything. For sure, absolutely. As soon as we hear, we'll be sure to let you all know. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that. Um, can you hear me, Nazrin? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yes, I can hear. We can you. have you back when everything is out and launched oh yeah that, that's what i said uh, maybe next year i can have another one another webinar then i can give you an update of how the tool would look like and then another year i can do that as well and to see that i i love to do that and nick nick do you have any did you want to ask a question um yeah i mean i get like about uh, evaluating maintenance costs and life cycle costs for any selection kind of as a big portion of the project. Okay. So, so we're getting I, a little bit of feedback. So if you can repeat that question. Um, yeah, uh, Nick was asking about uh, how estimating maintenance costs, uh, you know, with regards to the life cycle of a, of a project. Does that, um, like. And how that factors into your cost, uh, most cost effective. And, and how does that factor into um, yeah. estimating cost? Oh, yeah, that's a very good. Effect? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I'm not sure if you have heard. There is a tool called IDSD. When I was at Colorado School of Mines, um, there was a team of um, uh, different universities. They developed the tool IDST tool, uh, which has which they developed a spreadsheet of life cycle cost assessment analysis for different counties and for different for different states. Uh, so we are referring, so they publish that and so they have it online. So what we are doing, um, we are referring to that Excel spreadsheet and we are connecting our tool with BMP train because it's applicable in Florida for the BMP assessment for the life cycle cost assessment. We are connecting that with that Excel spreadsheet. 
great. So we are using those operation maintenance that are specific for different for each for individual county within Florida. Um, so we have that tool. We have all the costs, so they have included so many details in that tool. Everything that you can think of is included in that. Um, so we're happy that to use that one. So right now, my student and I are figuring out how to connect these three together. Then we can start doing this cost optimization thing and including the, those costs. Nazarin, would you mind typing the name of that? Um, yeah, that tool. Yeah. Yes, IDST. Thank you. I can also share the link with you, um, the link of that Excel spreadsheet that is for the life cycle cost assessment. It's free. I mean, it's, um, I think someone at Georgia Tech um, also was in that group and she she shared that like so so it's like there there is public there is a thesis and also they have a link of this excel spreadsheet as well somewhere so i can i can share that via email with you so, yeah and i don't have the exact date but i believe um UFIFIS is going to be hosting a green infrastructure maintenance workshop so um for this um individuals who actually implement the green infrastructure um, heard that there's sort of a lack of understanding of the maintenance requirement of all of these tools. So um, there is an upcoming workshop. We can share information. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So, uh, can you share the information for, with me later? Yeah, absolutely. With that workshop? Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. We have about five minutes left. The chat box is currently quiet. So I'm just gonna ask that you hang on for a few more minutes to see if we get any um, last minute comments or questions. And in the meantime, Nazarene, I wanna thank you so much. This is a really exciting tool. And I know that our local yeah. governments are gonna be really- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm also, yeah, I'm also working with Hillsborough County um, so to, also apply this tool um, to for for the for the Sweetwater Creek watershed in Hillsborough County, and also we're going to include sea level rise, climate change scenarios in that tool as well. So yeah, I think um, that tool would be very helpful for local governments for sure. Yeah. And our colleague yeah. Holly, who's up in Brevard County, said that she went to a pilot of the um, the maintenance training last week, and it's supposed to roll out this year. So okay. I'll let you. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of thank yous so much for the excellent work and yeah you know, thank you so much <laughs> yeah, it was really nice talking to you all yeah but thank you from so much for invitation oh thank you and yeah. we look forward to having you back next year next year yeah sure thank you so much hope you have a good day thank you you okay. too and we look forward to seeing you all um in mid-august for our next presentation on um also on stormwater so Thanks, everyone. Thanks, right you again. Audience. <laughs> oh, <heck. laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.